Uh, hey guys, this is Dom Zook with Saving Throw uh, with another proficiency check. Uh, this uh, time I am uh, talking with Sherman Tommy of Lunar Games. Uh, they are coming out with a new RPG called Endless Realms, which launches on Kickstarter on April 24th. Uh, welcome, Sherman. Uh, thanks for having me, Dom. Um, I'm Sherman. I'm the head designer at Endless Realms. Awesome. So uh, I, I'm really happy that you were able to uh, meet with me today because there's I wanted to talk to you about Endless Realms because it's really cool. Uh, I believe Kirsty approached me about uh, uh, talking about the system um, and uh, sent me a few links and stuff, early early things to your Kickstarter. And I, I've been going through and sort of immersing myself in sort of the, the world of Endless Realms, which is really cool. I, I think it's really interesting. And, and as the head designer and also the guy who's going to be running this for us on stream <laughs> in, a, in a week or so, uh, I am, I'm very interested to hear sort of, sort of the background of Endless Realms, sort of, because uh, I've, I've read a few things, uh, some in other interviews that you guys have given about mm -hmm. sort of how this got started. But I, I, I want to hear it, I guess, sort of straight from the horse's mouth, as it were, like how, how Endless Realms kind of came to be and, and ultimately what you're hoping for with this Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, so it actually started with uh, Kirsty and her husband, Dan. Uh, mm -hmm. They kind of... They wanted to try and play around and see if they could s possibly make their own system. Uh, it originally started off as just kind of a, is this something that like might be possible that we can kind of play around with? Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of started building momentum from there. Uh, she found an artist who was completely willing to kind of start um, drawing up various artworks for the bestiary and the core book. And then from there, she just found more and more people. I actually uh, started off as a game tester for the game originally. Okay. Um, basically, uh, one of her friends was someone that I knew from um, from my hometown in Prince George. And she just kind of like mentioned that her friend was making a game and wanted to know if we kind of wanted to test it. Yeah. So me and my friends got together. We started playing it. And we really enjoyed the world that they'd kind of started building up. And then after kind of working on it for a while, I was brought onto the team along with uh, several writers and we kind of just snowballed out of there. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, so talk to me a little bit about your role as the head designer. So you came in a little bit later um, mm -hmm. after Kirsty and her husband sort of got things, the ball rolling. What was your sort of, what was your task, I guess, when you first started? What did you, what did you set about doing um well as when i kind of first came on as a game tester mm -hmm. my main role was really just to try and break the game as sure. much as possible right uh just kind of find areas that were really problematic and i just kind of gave a lot of notes and from there it just kind of kind of moved more into me working more on the classes and mm -hmm. the monsters and making sure everything was working as it was supposed to and not just randomly exploding with uh, <laughs> weird broken stuff. Right, right. Cool. Um, yeah, because I, I, I see that you did a lot of work with the, the uh, creature compendium. Is, do I have that right? Yeah, creature. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, that always fascinates me. I think that one of the things about Endless Realms that I sort of want to talk about is that it it is a, to me anyway, it's a familiar system that's, that's new. It, it kind of encapsulates a lot of different things from a lot of different systems mm -hmm. um, that then come together and sort of create a new sort of ideal system, as it were. Um, now, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't played it yet, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it played, but uh, I... I'm interested into like what were some inspirations that went into the game mechanics and stuff because it, I, I'll say it's a it's a it's a balanced system right that's what mm -hmm. that's sort of what's going around so it's a it's a D10 system almost an opposed D10 uh, uh, system right so mm -hmm. uh, if you want to talk a little bit about that then yeah um, so they didn't really 
Christy and like Dan were the ones who laid a lot of the early groundwork for mm -hmm. how the system kind of flows. Um, basically, deciding on using the the D10 and the comparative system. Yeah. They went. They ended up going with the D10 simply because they they didn't really like how there were a ton of different dice needed for a lot of um, various role play games. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of other kind of systems that do the same sort of thing and like kind of focus on a single die. Uh, they didn't really want to do d sixes just because it it's been done really well by other systems already. Sure. So they yeah. wanted to kind of try and um, go with something else, and the d ten just kind of seemed as a really solid choice among the the various dice you could use. Yeah. Well. And uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and for the um, comparative system, they they really just wanted to make sure that players were always engaged in the game. So regardless of whether you were being attacked or you were attacking, you were still kind of like feeling that your fate was kind of in your own hands. Sure. So instead of just getting like critically hit and just completely demolished, uh, essentially like you're still rolling and you still have a chance to roll really well and kind of be involved in things. So you're not really just kind of like sitting there taking whatever the, the GM's kind of dishing out with a monster. Right. Uh, so. I really like that it uses the D10 system because, or D10s in general, uh, as opposed mm. to D6s. Because, like you said, there are a lot of systems out there powered by the apocalypse, fate, and stuff that use yeah. D6s. Um, and I feel like a, a, a 10 has enough weight to it that uh, mm. it's it's like having a, d a D20, but but half of that, I guess. Um, <laughs> if you really want to break it down, um, uh, so. Something that that caught my eye was, uh, like I like I was talking about before, you had the, uh, the the way it looked to me was there was there was a lot like the best of of a lot of different systems, uh, mm -hmm. were sort of put together for this. Um, there's uh, the vices system, I guess that you have in here, uh, yeah. where there's sort of a a mechanic to sort of build the characters that have kind of uh, from my experience, like Savage Worlds, you have your edges and your hindrances, so you, you mm -hmm. have those things built in, or like Fate uh, that has those sort of character uh, beats built in that kind of help dictate how you're going to react to different situations. So there's, there's that which I, I find fascinating. Um, but what, what do you feel is like one of your favorite pieces of this system? Oh, uh, <laughs> hmm. Um, I, I do really like the vices and virtue system. Yeah. Uh, just because it, it's a nice way of really kind of focusing your character and knowing like th these are kind of the core traits of your character. Uh, as far as like my favorite thing in the game, uh, mechanics wise, I, I kind of really dig the fact that, um, you, you kind of build your character by spending experience. So mm -hmm. you kind of can go in whatever direction you really want with your character. It's it's one of the things that I really enjoy because if you wanted to focus on one specific area to, to other detriments, you, you're free to do so. And it just kind of uh, allows you to really, really get your character kind of built up how you want. Right, right. Yeah, the, it looks like there's a lot of... Um there's a lot of room for customization. And mm -hmm. I think what was made clear uh, in, in early on in the, in the core book uh, is that you wanted to make a system, or you all wanted to make a system that was easy for new RPG players to come into, but crunchy enough to give everyone sort of feel, feel give them the feel of an RPG, as it were. Yeah. Um, there was something interesting that I, that I read on here, um, so two characters of the same race and class can play entirely differently from one another. Um, I was hoping you could maybe elaborate on that. How, how exactly does that work? Because coming from, you know, someone who's maybe from a D&D &D background or something like mm -hmm. that, if you've got two, you know, uh, elven bards or something like that, there's, of course, different ways that you can play it, but you have a very... Uh, specific leveling system, you know, it's like they can mm -hmm. choose 
a, you know, one person can cho choose a school of valor or something, and then the other person can choose a different school. Uh, so there's a little bit of a variation, but in endless realms, it seems like there's a plethora of different directions that you can go. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you could talk about that. Yeah, uh, so we, it, it is similar to something you've probably seen in uh, other systems, like the the archetypes um, found in, in like Pathfinder, for instance, mm -hmm. where you can kind of take a specific sort of class path that kind of alters the way the, the class kind of plays out. Um, it was something we really kind of wanted to make sure that you had options to really really feel like if you're playing the same class in the same race, you're not necessarily going to, even if you have some of the same abilities, the actual way you're kind of running around in either combat or, or out of combat, we wanted to make sure it felt like you were different than mm -hmm. anyone else in your class. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's probably like most exemplified with the elementalist simply because of uh, how their class path kind of works because uh, the elementalist can wield um, any of six different elements. Mm -hmm. uh, with the class paths, you pick a prime element, and it's essentially the one that you're strongest with. But when you pick your prime element, it essentially locks you out of using two of the other uh, six elements. Oh, okay. Basically, the, the ones that are um, strong and weak to your element, mm -hmm. simply because they're, they're sort of opposed to what you kind of have come to represent. Mm -hmm. So because each of the, the different elements very much have a different flavor and mechanical feel to them, by doing that, not only are you kind of like um, choosing what you're really good at, it also kind of prevents you from doing other things mechanically. So it, it, it makes each different kind of elementalist feel very, very different from each other, even though they're all the same sort of class. Right, right. That's awesome. Um... Yeah, I was looking. Speaking of the classes, I was I was looking through here, and I, I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and and list them because I think that they're they're very interesting. And and again, one of the things that was stated is that uh, there was a desire to have to break free of the molds of the pathfinders and D and Ds that have mm -hmm. a sort of static, you know, class list. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, but yeah. it's they're having a little bit of a, of a different feel or flavor to, to the, those established classes. Um, and I, I'd, I'd like to hear about how you've been able to balance a lot of these, these classes. But first, let me, let me go into them. Um, so there's the Animancer, the Barbarian, the Dancer, the Dandy, which I think is really cool, the Elementalist, the Judicar, the Knight, the Ninja, Shrine Keeper, and Warden. And going through here, it's it's easy to sort of maybe draw some parallels with some other classes from other games. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the lore that you have created here um, and established that these classes are pulled from, I think that's one of the more um, engaging uh, pieces of Endless Realms is that you have that sort of story background of where these these classes kind of came from, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I am I am curious though, like how you've been able to go about because with D and D and everything, you've had sort of an established you know forty year history of a game that you know it's like okay, we know where these are going to go. Yeah. But here, you know, you're you're kind of starting afresh. So how how did you go about? Um, you know, sort of taking these and, and balancing them. Mm -hmm. um, well, for the casters, um, in the game, there's various different... Uh, instead of having a, just like kind of two specific overarching magic types, like divine and arcane, we split them up into different energy types. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we were kind of going through and making the mechanics for the various classes, we wanted to make sure each class each energy type specifically had a very specific feel to it. So that if you're using, um, if you're an animancer, which uses animus energy, which is the kind of the energy of life and death, mm -hmm. that if you're using that energy type, it's going to, 
every spell you cast very much feels like it belongs in that energy type. Whereas if you're playing like an elementalist, which uses the, the six elements, all of those very much feel like they're elemental magic. We wanted to make sure that each of the, the, the various types of magic in the system had their own flavor and stuck to like their own sort of mechanics to make sure that they kind of didn't didn't really cross over into the others too much so mm -hmm. that each one really really felt like it had its own identity right right and for the um for the for the class uh the the non-caster classes we we wanted to kind of do either our own takes on things that you've probably either already seen before or kind of feel very familiar from other games mm -hmm. or in other cases we kind of just wanted to do our own sort of uh our, our own general like take on on the class right um, we, we we do have the barbarian which you've probably seen in like a bajillion different systems sure but um in in endless realms the barbarians are actually fueled by uh, spirits of wrath so basically they're kind of um given a small little fragment of power which then kind of grows and shapes them and they kind of shape themselves as they grow in power and we wanted it, it to have a, a bit more of like a spiritual feel instead of just being kind of like your your regular old rage monster from the wilds. Right. Um, with uh, stuff like the the knight, we didn't really want just a a kind of um, generic fighter. We wanted all of the classes to really feel like they had a history within the world. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're training in that class, you actually have a kind of presence within the world. Everyone, if, if you're a knight then you're a knight for a specific reason. You you have like a code you follow. Right. You've trained with specific people, kind of that that sort of kind of field of things. Mm -hmm. you, um, yeah. No, I, I that that was that came kind of clear because I, as I was going through here, I, I I remember hitting Judicar and I was all like, oh Judicar, okay, well that sounds kind of paladin esque. And then right below that was knight, and I was all like, oh wait, <laughs> that's that doesn't that, okay. This is this is interesting. This is different. And then I go through here, and yet there is no generic fighter class. Every everyone has a very specific kind of role. I feel like, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, a lot of times other systems will sort of enhance those very generic base classes and enhance them into specific uh, roles for, for parties and stuff like that. Here you're sort of starting with a very specific role uh, mm -hmm. and then allow that sort of more generalization to occur over as you level, um, yeah. uh, which is, I think, an interesting way of taking that that leveling concept that, you know, instead of, instead of necessarily honing or, 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 you know, um, pinpointing the, the fighter as it were, you're sort of allowing the character to grow into more things based on whatever the player wants to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that's really interesting to me. Um, the other thing that I think is a lot of fun are, the the just the core races that you have i i think that the races and the classes i think are the two things that people are obviously going to connect with uh beyond just the system differences um and that i think we saw a little bit of this with with starfinder when that came out although a lot of the starfinder um core races were sort of analogs of races from Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas here, it's, it's sort of, you have just a wide variety. And, and although humans are here and are, are also, you know, they're the most um, uh, on the planet Loomis, which is where a lot of this takes place, right? Um, yeah. They are the most... They're all over the place, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're, as they're as humans kind of tend to be spread around. But um, <laughs> within the when we were, we actually very uh, heavily considered just taking humans out completely uh -huh. when we were in the game. Um, we eventually decided on keeping them in just because there are going to be players who just want to to play a human. They kind of want to play themselves in exploring various worlds. Sure. And we didn't really want to kind of take that away from players. So um. While we did kind of add them in, we still wanted to make sure that they 
it didn't really feel like a human world with like other creatures. Humans are really, really present across Loomis, mm -hmm. um, the, the world where uh, much of the kind of early campaign stuff that we're working on is going to be taking place. But we wanted to make sure that it it felt like the world itself was alive and and humans were simply like one part of that mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of being the, the mainstay with other elements mixed in. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's great that that humans humans are there, but it's it's interesting to me is that um, while you have humans, you have uh, like the Salians. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Salians, Salians. Um, <laughs> there, there's actually a, kind of an argument among the, uh, the <laughs> on specifically how to say it. Um, I, I kind of feel like Silian uh, sounds Cylian? a bit better. Okay. But, um, uh, one of our head writers uh, is is very kind of um, very adamant that it should be Cillian, so Cillian. it's, it's yeah. probably going to be Cillian. It's going but... to be one of those things where you yeah. know uh, players will you know twenty years from now keep keep arguing over you know oh well the head <laughs> designer said it this way. Um, so, but you have the the Cillians, <laughs> um, and how they've been around for a long time and were mm -hmm. one of, you know, one of, if not the first core races on Loomis. Um, sort of taking that away from humans necessarily, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that I, I like, I like it when games kind of take things and, and change it around. And I think mm -hmm. that that's sort of a recurring theme with Endless Realms is that sort of taking, again, the tropes that you're used to in RPGs and just twisting them enough that you feel like it's kind of a new, um, a, just a new world to sort of inhabit. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to touch on was, was Loomis itself and just sort of the concept of the game uh, in that the endless realms are portals, right? They're, they're yeah. opened up here and can, you can kind of go almost anywhere into any different kind of um, uh, environment and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so it, the, the idea is that basically um, there's many different realms of existence um, with each one kind of embodying different concepts. There's the material realm, uh, basically Loomis, um, places like Earth and, and basically like our universe essentially. And then there are the other places like the, the dream realm where kind of chaos energy rules supreme. Mm. Uh, there's the, the elemental realm where the various elemental energies are kind of ever present. And you have uh, worlds like gas giants where it's filled with nothing but wind energy, um, worlds of nothing but like magma and flame. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to kind of make sure that um, it, it felt like there were, endless possibilities for like people to kind of play around in and also kind of leave us our own kind of leeway to if we wanted to move into other kind of settings in the future we can still have them kind of still take place in the same universe essentially right. so if we wanted to do eventually like a steampunk setting or a kind of a really gothic horror setting we can still have them kind of take place in the same universe and potentially have some of the same races on those worlds sure. even if it isn't necessarily Loomis. Right. Yeah, that, and that's, that's fascinating. That's good planning is what that is. <laughs> when, as you go down the road and you're like, yeah. oh, man, we, uh, now we need to try and get these people all on board with this. Um, uh, that's a lot of fun. I, uh, one of the things I think that, that caught my eye was the attention to detail in not just the, the, the book, but the, um, well, yeah, I mean, just, just sort of everything about this. And so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, how, do you guys just have like a massive whiteboard? Like, how were you able to balance, you know, go like, okay, well, there's this, and these people came from here, and they're going over here, this is their purpose, and this class is, you know, sort of, how, how can you give me some insight into the process of being the head designer here? <laughs> um, it, it, it's basically like a massive uh, spider web of uh, Dropbox files and <laughs> just conversations in uh, Discord. Right. <laughs> where we basically kind of uh, had like specific, uh, Discord kind of groups specifically just so we can 
talk out and flesh out different ideas. Um, a lot of the the very early stuff was all kind of written up by uh, Kirsty, Dan, and the, the first writer, which mm-hmm. was um, uh, Joseph. And from there, it kind of just um, built up, and we all kind of kept coming together and making sure that we were all on board with whatever ideas or changes we had. So if we wanted to kind of tweak a certain idea, we wanted to make sure that that was still felt within the world itself. So it, it didn't just... We didn't just suddenly say like, uh, oh yeah, silence were actually like uh, like this, and then not actually make sure it's written into everything. Right, right. So yeah, it it was um, it, it's a lot of uh, kind of documents split up into a lot of different places, but we have we have a fairly um small ish team mm-hmm. right now, so it's not too hard to make sure that like everyone knows everything that's kind of going on in the world uh we do have i think uh four writers currently and they all kind of uh, make sure that they're kind of talking to each other and and if i kind of make a certain change with mechanics and what like a certain energy type is supposed to be doing mm-hmm. i make sure that basically everyone's kind of everyone's aware of things and on board with everything right right um yeah that's that it's always fascinating to me um, how, you know, like I've I've only really, you know, delved kind of into one specific universe, right? And mm-hmm. and building a character or, or building building a short campaign or something like that. Like I'll I'll be part of it, but not over everything. So I'm always fascinated by people who are sort of just touching all those little bits and just being like, oh, we can't do that because these guys are, are coming yeah. and doing this here. So um, talk to me a little bit about the, the Kickstarter. So you're going for uh, 38,000, which is, uh, I believe, or should uh, I? Yes, uh, 38,000 Canadian. 38,000 Canadian. So, um, uh, and that launches on... April 24th and uh, the the book is essentially written um, yeah. so you're just going for the formatting and uh, basically publication costs um, yeah. so which is great because a lot of times I see a lot of Kickstarters that start up and no one's even written anything yet they're, they're, they're just like we want you know sixty thousand dollars to maybe write a book uh, mm. And here, and, and this is like how much we think it might cost to write a book. <laughs> yeah, and support us for like the the two years that it might take us to possibly write it. Right, right. Uh, it's it's always crazy, and people always will back those things. It's it's yeah, it's fascinating. But here, the book is done, um, and I've been lucky enough to read it. Uh, but um, what what are some of the the like stretch goals and stuff because i think you guys have some some cool things that are going on there um we do have the uh, digital art book which is basically kind of um a collection of all of the the sketch work and the various kind of design notes that our artist kind of went through mm-hmm. as she created the the art for the the races and the classes and the, the various monsters um basically um Kirstie is also kind of like the art director so her she works pretty closely with the um, with Jennifer Elliott, the the artist of uh, the game, mm-hmm. to basically kind of um, constantly go back and forth over various ideas. So I, I've seen like some of the sketches, and it, it's really always interesting to kind of see how the original idea evolved into like the final kind of stages of things. And the digital art book's basically kind of meant to cover all of that yeah. and just kind of show what the process was for creating the art for the world. Uh, beyond that, we, um, uh, a couple of fan, a, a number of our fans have actually kind of really dug the Dengu race. Um, and Kirsty kind of mentioned almost, uh, jokingly early on that she wanted to do a, a classical Dengu poetry book. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to really kind of, uh, take off with a lot of people. So one of the stretch goals is to actually kind of get that done and basically kind of, um, written up and and sent out to people and it's, it's basically a, a poetry book written from the perspective of dangus within the world <laughs> nice. so it's it, it's kind of a, a look into both a kind of how dangu view things um, yeah. who are Kirsty's favorite race <laughs> and kind of just a, a way of a way of kind of making the 
just another kind of layer of making the world kind of feel more alive. Sure. Like this is this is there's actually like history to these races and they they come from different areas and have different feelings on various matters. Um, after that, we had a stretch goal for uh, the short story book, which is basically a number of short stories written from the perspective of various characters within the setting. Mm -hmm. uh, I've actually s managed to see um, a few of the, the early ones that are kind of being written up for it, assuming we actually managed to kind of uh, hit that stretch goal. Um, and they're actually like really, really well done. They're all they're all kind of written up by um, uh, our one of our writers, uh, Catherine. And I'm I'm actually like really always looking forward to kind of seeing if if a new story has popped up in the, the in the, the Dropbox to kind of read through and and see more of the the world from the various characters' perspectives. Uh -huh. uh, beyond that, we also had a. Um, we had, I believe, a an early campaign book that we wanted to set out. Um, if we actually managed to get that high, I know we also have um, uh, just as an. Uh, let me. I just want to double check to make sure I'm sure. Not uh, incorrect on things. Uh, okay, so yeah. Um, so we do have a kind of early campaign book, and as a stretch goal, um, we also wanted to kind of put out more, basically a book of short adventures to kind of get people launched into the the setting to kind of because we because we are kind of doing our our own thing with much of the the races and the world and the classes. We wanted to have a number of adventures kind of ready to go uh, when we do launch, mm -hmm. just, just to kind of allow people to get an early taste of what we kind of feel the game is as opposed to just kind of throwing the book at people and being like yeah just uh start doing your own stuff right away right just because a lot of the stuff is fairly different so yeah uh beyond that um i believe most of the other stretch goals were related to the um various race books Mm -hmm. which are basically kind of further expanding on the the lore behind the various races and kind of giving you a a look at some of the other some of the other races that have kind of developed within the world I, again i i have worked on a couple of kickstarters and have certainly backed my fair share of kickstarters so the seeing the amount of work that you guys have already done um to sort of realize this vision uh is Definitely heartening, especially with, you know, so many, the preponderance of, of RPG Kickstarters that are out there. Um, the And then the other thing that I really like about this project is that it is uh, uh, led by women. Um, mm -hmm. And and you have women in very prominent positions there and stuff, which is super cool. Uh, just, I... I I really get the, uh, you know, the, the, the good feeling of, of it being both a, a independent sort of work, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, but also very collaborative too. Um, and the, the, the lore, I, I mean, I can't, people who are watching this, I can't get into all of the lore, but it's like, <laughs> you, you'll, you will see when this comes out uh, what I'm talking about. But, it's, but what you guys, I mean, I can't imagine uh, I, I think I read somewhere that you know you guys were were working at, as much as you can between day jobs and all these other things like I don't know how many hours a week every week for the like the last year or something like that trying to put this all together. Mm -hmm. And um, go ahead, uh, Christy. Uh, Christy and Dan actually started about four years ago. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Uh, <laughs> they kind of um, just started working on the initial idea of everything back then. Um, around like I think. A few months later is when she first found uh, the artist and um, the first writer, Joseph. Mm -hmm. And then kind of from there, uh, I joined in as a tester, I think, two and a half years ago. Hmm. And then uh, about like after eight months, I started kind of working in more of the design department, kind of just taking on more stuff from there. Um, but yeah, uh, so Kirsty is like the... The, the the main kind of the CEO of our company and kind of the the main head and idea behind everything. Yeah. 
and yeah, uh, our our team's actually grown um kind of kind of big from what where it from where it kind of began. Uh-huh. Uh, I think we have like uh seven of us working on it That's... as basically like a a lot of our, our kind of uh main stuff right well i mean that's that's pretty impressive when you're you know you're just you haven't even started the kickstarter yet and there's already yeah. seven people who are dedicated to seeing it through so that's awesome um cool well uh i don't have anything else uh right now uh, unless there's anything else you want to throw out there about the kickstarter or about the game that you think uh people um, might want to know uh it goes to kickstarter uh april 2024th i believe mm-hmm. uh, just yeah so it com- um goes to kickstarter april 24th uh the i think we've covered a lot of the kind of uh, overarching mechanics of the game um so yeah, I think that's uh, largely uh, largely covers kind of like the the overall scope of what we're kind of setting out to do. Um, we're only really going to Kickstarter for the the printing costs of the of the uh, the core book and the bestiary. Um, right. There isn't really any uh, GM's guide, basically, because a lot of that's all been incorporated into the the um, core book. Yeah, so it's it's very Pathfinder-esque in that in that way. There's just mm-hmm. one core book that's then that's all you need essentially. The 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 creature com- compendium that you have uh, that that sounds super cool and and I'm looking forward to seeing more from that. So um, yeah, but yeah. Um, basically like all of the art for both of them is all done. Uh, you can see a lot of our art on I believe the website mm-hmm. along with uh, our Facebook group. Uh, the the creep uh, the bestiary has, I believe it's going to have two hundred and fifty monsters in it in total, all wow. of them with like full art. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> um, cool. Well, I can't wait uh, to see this, and I can't wait to play it. Um, which is, I I know it's going to be crazy. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, so good luck with this Kickstarter. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, you guys. I'll be watching it very closely, and I'm sure a lot of people out there who are watching this will also be tuning in. So, so looking forward to seeing what happens. And uh, thank you very much, Sherman, for for coming and joining me on this. And thanks for having me. I will talk to you soon. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.